You might be wondering to yourself, why the hell is there another Resident Evil 4 video? I thought he uploaded the intro video like months ago. Where the hell have the rest of the videos been? The answer to that is actually a lot more boring than you would think. Basically, I graduated with my degree in film, and I've been stuck applying for jobs on LinkedIn every single morning while working 50 plus hour weeks in retail management hell. So that inspired me to say, you know what? Fuck it. I'm tired of waiting for something to fall in my lap. <laughs> so let's just go back to making the content that I actually want to make. We have no choice! So with that out of the way, let's jump straight back into discussing why Resident Evil 4's game design is awesome. For this video, I'm going to be handing the voiceover duties to my old friend Francisco, who helps around the Yugi Boom channel. The link to his channel will be in the description below. Hey, thanks for the shout out, man. I really appreciate that. But without any further ado, let's get right into it. Resident Evil 4 has garnered an acclaim since its release due to a multitude of reasons, ranging from its John Carpenter aesthetics, its oppressive atmosphere, or its infamously cheesy and self-aware B-movie story. You stay here with Leon. He is better with the ladies. I've been expecting you, my brethren. No thanks, bro. I've sent my right hand to dispose of you. Your right hand comes off? Where's everyone going? Bingo? <laughs> <laughs> However, the most important aspect of Resident Evil 4 is without a doubt its game design, which dictates how the player is forced to interact with the game on its own terms through a multitude of gameplay mechanics. As a side note, it's cool to see how Resident Evil 4's game design has had such an influence on basically every third-person game that uses an over-the-shoulder camera perspective. Two easy examples of this being echoed throughout the industry include Gears of War and Dead Space, both of which closely emulate the camera perspective as well as other mechanics that simulate the game feel. Unfortunately, you can also somewhat blame the success of Resident Evil 4 for the rise of generic copycat third-person shooters. Resident Evil 4's Mercenaries mode was also copied into Gears of War's Horde mode, so you can essentially blame the trend of games with tacked on Horde modes on Resident Evil 4 as well. Thanks a lot for ruining games for a couple of years, Capcom! Why don't you do something useful like make some bad games instead? Ooh, yeah, never mind. We're good now. Resident Evil 4 utilizes the ancient control design of Tank Controls. Controls as a key pillar of its game design. And you might already be thinking to yourself, hey, that's fucking stupid. Tank Controls don't feel natural and frustrate the player because it strips away seamless control over its character. Well, to those people, I'm gonna let you in on a little super duper tiny secret. That's the entire point, ya dummy. By limiting the character's movements, abilities, and speed, the game succeeds in heightening the horror and tension that the players feel. Being unable to move and dodge throughout the combat arenas makes the player feel helpless and vulnerable against enemies, as well as forcing them to compensate for the limited movement by using strategies that complement it. Tank controls limit players purely to moving forwards and backwards as well as slowly pivoting the character and camera to the left and right. The lack of ability of being able to just strafe left and right will leave most modern gamers that attempt to play the game understandably confused if not outright annoyed. However, it is important to note that the game is entirely designed around these limitations. Hypothetical scenario. The next Call of Duty game is released with the same exact game design elements, except for the fact that they force people to use tank controls. That would be stupid because the rest of the game isn't designed around this. Tank controls were seen as a necessary evil in the earlier games due to the nature of their fixed camera angles. Having a modern control method would disorient the players as their controls suddenly flip as they transition to a new angle, leading to constant frustration as they reorient themselves time and time again. The tank controls of the older games affected the entirety of their combat scenarios with the emphasis on tight enemy encounters that revolved around hallways in which characters would narrowly avoid danger. Well, that is until the re 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 remake enabled players to use modern control scheme, which completely broke the balance of the game. Enemy encounters became a joke as the player could swerve and juke around danger like a quarterback. So when people say that the re-release of Resident Evil 4 should use a modern control scheme for newer players, you're basically asking Capcom to destroy the carefully tuned balance that the game achieves. What people don't recognize about their perceived frustrations towards tank controls is that the game design is built around them, 
meaning that everything from the environment to the enemy's movements and attacks are designed around the limitations of the player. The enemies in particular are balanced in such ways so that the tank controls don't provide an unfair advantage that the enemies have over the player. The enemies themselves are for the most part restricted to tank controls themselves except for the minor dodges that they do. In addition to this, the enemies uniformly have a slow movement speed, just as Leon does. With the limitations of tank controls, the player is forced to adapt a new strategy, such as using the tactic of funneling, in which the player finds narrow areas with the combat arenas in which the enemies only have one avenue towards Leon. By doing this, the player is able to ensure that the area behind them is completely safe, while being able to effectively pick off enemies in an efficient manner. However, failure to eliminate the enemies fast enough usually leads to the player having to abandon their post in search of better opportunities than simply standing in the middle of town and being flanked. This is how the game is designed to be played, a type of musical chairs in which the player is constantly being forced to adapt to the ever-changing scenarios that they find themselves in. Without tank controls, Resident Evil 4 would just be yet another run-and-gun shooter. Formulating strategies that complement your movement restrictions creates an even greater sense of accomplishment for the player. As previously stated, Resident Evil 4's over-the-shoulder camera perspective has become one of the most pervasive influences still visible in gaming. Seriously, look at basically any modern third-person shooter's camera's perspective when it comes down to shooting guns. The over-the-shoulder perspective does an effective job of heightening the tension and action simply by pulling the player closer to the events occurring on the screen. It's the same reason why a close-up in a horror movie is more likely to make your pants change colors. And while some modern games, such as the Uncharted series only use the over-the-shoulder camera when the player is actively aiming their weapon, Resident Evil 4 never lets go of it, and this solidifies to the player that the tension of the combat is always present. In a similar vein to the game's tank controls, the camera perspective serves as a constraint that the player has to learn to adapt to. With the camera giving such a limited field of view that only showcases enemies directly in front of Leon, the player is forced to maintain constant spatial awareness of where the enemies are as well as using strategies such as the aforementioned funneling tactic. A mean little trick, and admittedly probably a hilarious one for the developers, is the game's bear traps that are hidden in the foliage. Due to the camera perspective, players will more than likely not even see them, with the first mistake forcing them into a constant state of paranoia. This is slightly less of an issue in the HD releases of the game, as the updated textures and resolutions make their appearances more obvious. The game's practice of using its cameras in order to force players into being more observant of their surroundings only escalates with the tripwire explosives that the enemies use. While bombs themselves are often easy to see because the enemies are so gosh darn nice to make them glow brighter than Rudolph, the wires themselves are hard harder to discern. On a hilarious side note, it's completely stupid that the enemies that set the traps have seemingly forgot where they put them, can't see the bombs, or they just don't plain care that they're about to kill themselves. Game theory! Are the Ganados of Resident Evil 4 actually part of a suicide cult? Are they suffering from post-Undertale depression? On a less game designy note, the camera perspective also does a better job of players feeling close to the character on screen. This is such a basis of cinema, with close-ups being used to show a more intimate personal look at the character's emotions and intensity, while long shots imply solidarity and emotional distance. It's part of the reason why characters like Leon, Nathan Drake, and Kratos are so beloved on a personal level. Players literally spend hours up close with these characters in addition to the narrative and characterization fleshing their personalities out. Leon, it's been six hours since our last transmission. I was starting to get worried. Don't you mean lonely? Sure, people love some characters from first-person games like Master Chief, but the emotional context and actually relatability of the character are nil. The closeness of the camera perspective also ratchets the emotional intensity of the player wanting to make sure the character doesn't, well, I don't know, get straight up fucking massacred. <laughs> Squeamish players will have it solidified real quick that they should probably avoid dying because that shit is right up in your face. You can totally make arguments that being killed in first person games is horrifying on its own regard, but seeing the multitude of ways that a character in third person can be mutilated just appeals more to the horror fan in me.
As with any game with heavy emphasis on gun combat, the aiming mechanics kind of play a big role. While most shooters employ the reticles with their near pinpoint accuracy, Resident Evil 4 instead relies on the principles of inaccuracy, laser sights, and immobility. You, along with many angry forum posters, might be thinking, well, that's stupid. It literally uses shitty controls and aiming. To that I respond with, that's the whole point. You're not meant to play like this generic soldier number 69 from the latest Call of Duty game. It's almost as if this is a horror game. On a base level, the laser sight is used in order to create a sense of diegeticness, with the world instead of using reticles for the context of the player instead of the character. In addition to this, the laser sight actually veers right of center in relation to the distance of the target. This can throw people off that have been accustomed to basically every shooter out there, but it actually forces them to adjust to the greater sense of authenticity that the game demands of them. The laser also turns into a distinctive dot whenever it hovers over enemies and destructible objects in order to indicate to the player that they should probably shoot it. Lesson 1. If there's a dot on the enemy and it's alive, you should shoot it. With this at the player's disposal, they will be able to tell if grounded enemies are still alive or not. As a rule of thumb, due to the limitations of the game being designed around the horsepower of the GameCube, the majority of enemies dissolve into the ground when they die. You could try to be that guy and make the devil's advocate argument in which the parasites dissolve the body, but the cold hard truth of the matter is that the game is preserving the system memory by removing the corpses from the stage. However, this rule isn't applied to all enemies as mini bosses will have their corpses linger permanently in the stage. The breaking of the motive of enemies disappearing creates a paranoia in the player. They might ask, why is the body still there? Are they gonna get back up and attack me the second I turn around? Lesson 2. Not all bodies disappear. This reinforces to the player that they should use a laser to make sure if an enemy is actually dead or not. So, players just about halfway through the game might be thinking that everything's all sunshines and rainbows now, right? You're wrong! The motif of dot equals alive is tossed on its head with the night enemies. Regardless if the knight actually contains a parasite or not, the suit of armor will register as a shootable object. This creates an even greater dissonance than before as the player realizes that the reliance on the laser system has been stripped away in the context of these enemies. They'll approach every single suit of armor with caution as a potential threat, with the eventual attack from one being all the more frightening. Lesson 3. This game just loves to fuck with you. The laser is actually quite handy for finding treasures. Players might initially disregard the alluring shiny glare that treasures emit from walls and ceilings, but aiming your laser at them reveals that the player can shoot them. It is conveyed entirely through, hey, look at me, I'm a shiny. <laughs> Dot on the laser means you abuse your Second Amendment rights that the player can gain treasure by shooting the shit in the environment. The inaccuracy of the aiming system plays a pivotal role in creating tension as well as empowerment of a more accurate weapon. Leon, despite being a zombie survival veteran and being a total badass working directly for the president, isn't exactly the most accurate of gunslingers. Leon's aim is in a constant sway. This simulates both the fear that Leon feels due to the not exactly rainbow and sunshine predicaments that he finds himself in, as well as the fact that people just kind of naturally aren't pinpoint machines. This emulation can also mirror the player's own fear of the scenarios they find themselves in. This is less of a concern when enemies are up close in Leon's face, but the effects of the sway become all the more apparent at greater distances. Shots can be certainly lined up at a long range, but with the laser moving around so widely, it becomes a challenge. This design of inaccuracy subtly pushes the player into engaging enemies in a medium to close quarters combat. However, one divergence from the mechanic of inaccuracy comes from the sniper rifles. The snipers use a scope, which which allows for pinpoint headshots at any distance. The sniper is easily the best weapon class in the game due to its ability to blow up heads like it's no tomorrow. The game counterbalances this useful weapon by pulling an Oliver Twist and giving you barely any ammunition for the damn thing. Another way this is countered is by the regenerator enemies, whom have parasites that have to be shot with the thermal sniper scope. This forces players at this point in the game to ration their sniper ammunition, opting to save it for these enemies instead of going full Rambo every opportunity. In addition to the laser system and accuracy, comes the design of being completely immobile while aiming. This is definitely one thing that tends to piss off new players, but having to dedicate yourself to a stance while trying to fend off hordes of enemies creates its own unique brand of tension that wouldn't exist if you could run around at the same time. Along with the previous principles and strategies that the players use to adapt to the game, it makes it crystal clear to the players how they should be playing.
The game's combat revolves around three methods of attacking, shooting, swinging your knife instead of, you know, stabbing, and contextual melee opportunities. These three inputs create a gameplay flow in which the player stuns enemies by shooting their weak points, doing some karate type shit, and then doing the equivalent of spamming the low kick in Mortal Kombat. It's not the fairest way to fight, but Leon's gotta survive somehow, and this is without the doubt the most efficient way to play the game by maximizing your resources. That's kind of important in a game where ammunition is limited. Okay, this isn't to say that the player is as ammo starved as the previous entries in the series, it just demands that they're smart with what they've got. The action direction that Resident Evil 4 took the series down can be attributed to the character empowerment that comes through Leon's arsenal of weapons. The weapons in previous games might as well be pea shooters. No, not that kind. This isn't to say that Leon is an unstoppable badass as he can still be killed just as easily by the enemies in the game. In games like Outlast or Alien Isolation, the fear is derived from being completely powerless against the murderous force and running away or hiding. Resident Evil 4, on the other hand, forces you to kind of deal with the issue head on. It's kind of like a really fucked up psychiatrist that actually gives good full advice. This flow does evolve in the later sections of the game, in which the player is supplied with the greater amounts of ammunition alongside the weapon upgrades that they've accumulated. This harvest of greater yields of ammunition allows the player to take greater resource risks by saying fuck it and completely unloading on the enemies. These reserves allow the player to disengage from the survival horror tactics of the combat flow and transition into a pure action game. This in turn is used to serve the purpose of player empowerment, further cementing the fact that they have become better over time. One of the biggest divergences in both gameplay and the narrative tone comes from Leon's contextual melee attacks. In previous games, you try your damn best to stay as far away from the enemies, in Resident Evil 4, you'll be roundhousing and suplexing dudes left and right like it's a leg day at the gym. Leon can initiate these attacks by stunning enemies and by shooting them in typically their faces or legs. This provides a brief window of opportunity for the player to dash forward and melee. Considering that this does a decent amount of damage and helps the player conserve ammo, it's the player's best interest to train Leon for his future career in the WWE. However, stunning enemies by shooting them in the face becomes a riskier endeavor than later in the game, as headshots will often result in Las Plagas emerging from the newly renovated real estate space on the enemy's head stumps. This means having to spend even more resources killing these enemies, as well as an even more dangerous threat. This forces the players to take a pause. Will they continue to aim for the head in a hope of instant kills and higher damage? Or will they choose the safer method of aiming for their legs? One of the biggest benefits of the melee system is its ability to leave enemies stunned on the ground, allowing the player to channel their inner Michael Myers and carve them up. Players can maximize on this strategy against multiple enemies by creating a constant rotation in which they constantly knock enemies down so that there's only one enemy on their feet at all times. In addition to this, kicks are able to affect more than one enemy, with a single one being enough to kick over entire crowds. But I'm not done yet! Another bonus of using melee attacks is the invincibility frames that comes with it, meaning that Leon can't take damage during the melee animation. You can easily abuse this by stunning an enemy and starting a melee attack just as a different enemy is about to strike. <laughs> Another change that Resident Evil 4 brought to the franchise is the upgrade system. It plays a central role in the game, as opting not to use it leaves Leon weak and defenseless against the stronger enemies he encounters. The upgrade system subtly motivates the player to make a concerted effort to hunt down as much treasure and money as possible in order to maximize their own potential. This actually goes against the core strategies of the earlier games, as they universally recommended to completely avoid enemies. Spending ammunition and health items on these enemies only serves as a detriment to the player. However, in in Resident Evil 4, the player is motivated to kill every single enemy in sight in order to become stronger. This changes the character and enemy dynamic, with Leon becoming the hunter instead of the hunted. And with the player hoarding their financial resources towards upgrades, they're also disincentivized from purchasing high-priced and limited quantity first aid sprays, instead opting to simply become better at the game. This system creates its own game design of risk versus reward scenarios. When the player is confronted with having to choose between a horde of ganados or gigante, a risk-driven player will instead Instead, opt to go down both paths, knowing full well that they'll be financially compensated for their trouble. And while this is a premeditated decision that the player makes, a more visceral and immediate one has to be made when Leon is confronted by two BDSM-loving gigantes at the same time. And this is without a doubt one of the toughest battles in the game, as even one gigante is more than a challenge on its own. Thankfully for the player, the Ted Mosby architect of this dungeon conveniently built a gigante-sized fire pit that Leon can use to plummet one of those bosses into. This sounds awesome and gratifying, right? 
Well, yeah, you're totally right. But by doing this, the player loses out on a huge sum of money that they could have gained if they defeated the Gigante normally. It's in this moment that the player has to weigh in their options. If they choose greed, they need to ensure that they have the resources and skill necessary to accomplish the task. If they choose safety, they set themselves back an upgrade or two. One of Resident Evil 4's biggest innovations that still has yet to fully be adapted into modern games is enemy reactions to being attacked. In the overwhelming majority of modern shooters, enemies simply brush off being shot as completely inconsequential. They act as complete bullet sponges that only react to being shot once they die. One of the biggest perpetrators of this is Destiny, in which raid bosses just kind of stand there soaking in bullets like they're getting a tan on the beach. Even when enemies do react into getting shot in other games, it's mostly generalized stun state regardless of where they're actually getting hit. You see, in Resident Evil 4, enemies will have a completely different reaction based on where the bullets hit them. For example, shooting an enemy in the head violently thrust it backwards, with enemies often grasping the wound with the hand and screaming before reeling back, being pretty reasonably pissed off. No, I got shot for real! Or, like enemies shot on the legs, will either grasp it in pain or fall down to their knees. Shooting them again while they're in this position shows the kinetic effect of the bullet by sending them collapsing backwards. Or event point blank torso shots get a slight reaction from enemies as their bodies slightly push back on the specific impact point. Shots to the arms force enemies to twist the corresponding direction and shooting them in their hands or the weapons that they're using result in them losing access to it. This becomes its own offensive opportunity with enemies that use dynamite with some weirdly variable fuse lengths. You can stall for time by repeatedly stunning the before the dynamite goes full roadrunner on them, or you can outright just shoot the dynamite itself. One of Resident Evil 4's best selling points that sets it aside from the rest of its peers in the pantheon of gaming is its variety. Having a wide variety of enemies allows for a countless amount of variables that when combined with one another create a dynamic scenario in which the player is forced to adapt to. Compare this to any Call of Duty campaign where you have a dude with a rifle, a dude with a submachine gun, a dude with a shotgun. They're basically the same exact enemy mechanically. Your tactic towards engaging with them stay the same. Hit them with two to five bullets and they're dead. The basic form of enemies the player must contend with are the ganados, or zombies, or whatever you want to call them. They appear in three different variants, the villager, the cultists, and the soldiers. Their tactics don't vary too much from each other, but each new class gives them greater access to weapons, such as crossbows, scythes, and machine guns. Where the ganados become even more interesting than previously noted is Las Plagas, which previously mentioned turn a basic encounter into a prolonged fight. The stage 1 variety prevents Leon from getting close due to its wide swinging sight, while the stage 2 will outright kill him with one chomp. The stage 3 can spit acid even at long distances while also being able to detach after the main body dies. The Plagas serve as the purpose of bringing your strategy strategy to a complete halt mid-battle and force you to adapt. Ah, oh, and chainsaw enemies. They force players to either run or focus their fire on them instead of the horde, with stun animations only coming from multiple headshots in a row or a shoddy, aka shotgun. The not zombie dogs make their standout appearance in the castle's maze, as their constant quiet footsteps and anxiety inducing growls hiding behind the foliage fill the player with paranoia and anticipation for when they finally jump out. The I wanna be Wolverine but I'm not dudes reply on sound in order to locate Leon. Firing your weapon will send them flying to the origin of sound and flailing their arms like they're at a hardcore show. Resisting the urge to not sprint away is a bit hard when you consider the fact that they're fucking terrifying. The player will have to wait or use bells in the arena in order to give themselves opportunities to attack its weak point for massive damage. The Novistadors throw another wrench into the machine by being able to fly, climb on walls, and oh yeah, be fucking invisible. You've gotta be a mix of cautious and perceptive while fighting these. Uh, at least until a later part of the game where they just kinda give up on being invisible. Ugh. And the Night Plagas. As enemy encounters, they have a stupid amount of health and damage dealing capacity. Dealing with one at a time isn't too bad, but fighting the Three Musketeers version of them doesn't leave the player too much opportunity to actually attack back. In the same vein of the enemy variety is the game's numerous standout boss battles in which each of them having their own challenges and quirks. They're completely over the top monstrosities that I absolutely love like they're my own child. The battle against the giant fish boy stands out as the most inherently unique due to it taking place in a set piece on a boat, which tosses every piece of game knowledge that the player has learned outside the window. It's also pretty terrifying to get eaten by it, so uh, maybe don't shoot the water before the battle. <laughs> 
The Gigantes completely dominate the combat arena spatially, and their unrelenting attacks don't leave you much room. Fortunately, one of them has ADHD and can resist the urge to pet the dog. The optional second encounter with the Gigante forces the player into a narrow canyon with no immediate means of escape or dodging. Did I mention you have Ashley with you? And you also have to protect her? No! God! No! God, please, no! Honestly, I usually just skip this fight because I can't do a good enough job making sure she doesn't die. Of course, you could always just do the complete opposite and let the giant grabber as a distraction while you unload on him. The battle against the village chief forces Leon to constantly run around the claustrophobic barn while dodging his long-reaching attacks. Halfway through the battle, the chief pulls out Perot Jared and takes off his pants, which allows him to climb along the rafters in order to sneak behind the player. The Vertigo fight is actually partially skippable. Although the player would lose out on treasure, the battle starts as a chase sequence completely infested with quick time events where the player can't actually fight back. When the beast does appear, the player can only do sizable amounts of damage by using canisters found in the sewers in order to freeze it. This creates a unique cat and mouse reversal throughout the entire fight. The player most likely wouldn't even be able to kill the boss with the canisters, which creates its own diarrhea inducing horror. It's at this point that the elevator that the player called four minutes ago decides to show up. The vertigo battle boils down to being able to stall the boss's advances until you can escape, which makes it one of the best battles in the game. The pre-fight against the U3 continues this trend of cat and mouse in a totally not scary at all floating maze cage above the abyss. Leon is forced to find his way around the maze and unlocking adjacent cages in order to escape, all the while fending off the hentai monster. It's also cool to note that any damage done to the U3 only deters it momentarily, and this damage doesn't help during the final battle against it. Overall, it's amazing! Get it? Um, uh, you got it. The battle against Krauser seems pretty easy, right? It's just an army dude, right? WRONG! This battle takes up an entire segment of the game, as he stalks you throughout a complex with gunfires, grenades, and surprise, close quarter knife fights. This eventful final battle against Krauser is the toughest in the game, due to not only his damage output and speed, but also the three minute timer on the explosives placed on the entire stage. Krauser's onslaught forces Leon to constantly be on the defensive while making a calculated risk to become aggressive and launch attacks whenever they can. Fortunately for Leon, Krauser doesn't seem to understand that his his shield doesn't really cover his knees. Are you ready for that M. Night Shyamalan? Because this final boss battle against Saddler goes full fucking John Carpenter in a writhing mess of gore and tendrils. Is this terrifying? Yes. Is this an easy boss battle? Yes, yes it is. While Saddler can attack at great distances, all the player has to do is shoot the eyes on the legs in order to set up a melee attack. You can also channel your inner Bob the Builder and use the power of construction tools to give him a good smacking. Oh, and uh, as per Resident Evil tradition, you do get a rocket launcher near the end of the fight to kill him instantly. Resident Evil 4 alongside God of War are responsible for popularizing the use of quick time events, as their critical success inspired so many games of the 7th and 8th generation to adapt it, mostly to people's great annoyance though. Quick time events are associated with annoyance due to the fact that so many games abuse them by using them completely unnecessarily. You want to open this perfectly normal door? You better smash the fuck out of that A button. Resident Evil 4's approach to quick time events is to force the player to remain vigilant to the events unfolding on screen, regardless if it's during the gameplay or Cutscene. The gameplay QTEs, oh yeah, let's just abbreviate that from now on. The QTEs in gameplay force Leon to react quickly to enemy attacks, with failure resulting in heavy losses to his health. While this serves the purpose of creating tension, it also creates player empowerment by being so efficient at them. However, another aspect of the quick time events that Resident Evil 4 does better than modern games is the consistency and reliability of the buttons used. Evasive maneuvers are exclusively tied to two button combinations, being A and B, or L and R, at least on the GameCube controller. Limiting itself to two combinations, the game is able to create a sense of fairness, and the player is comfortable with making a split-second decision between the two options. God of War is particularly guilty about a lack of consistency in this regard. The other form of quick time events come from button mashing, which typically occurs during cutscenes. These are limited to mashing the A or B buttons, and is considerably more generous with the timing than other games. The button mashing here is fairly generous and easy to complete because the game doesn't rely on a certain amount of presses to warrant victory but an effort system. The effort system measures the pace and consistency of the player's button mashing. If they let up on their presses and slow down, the game will consider this a failure. It's also noteworthy that this system is far more friendly in terms of accessibility, as players unable to make this ridiculous amount of button presses will just wind up frustrated. Resident Evil 5 falls into this pitfall, or rather, lava fall. <laughs> While there's no official term for this subtle game mechanic, 
I'll borrow the name director from Left 4 Dead. Left 4 Dead's director is an AI system that constantly calculates how well the players are progressing through the level and removing or adding resources and enemies as necessary in order to constantly keep them in just the right amount of danger. It's kind of like walking on a high wire. If the game is too easy, you'll fall over to the left. If it's too hard, you'll fall over to the right. Having just the perfect balance of difficulty and being able to make it through the, on the skin of your teeth is considered the optimal gameplay experience for the director. The director in Resident Evil 4 serves a more subtle role, opting instead to be an invisible presence that will give less resources or increasing the amount of damage that enemies dole out. There are a few select areas in the game in which the director will spawn extra hordes of tougher enemies if the player is doing too well. This is most evident in the open water area in the castle, in which the crossbow and scythe enemies will spawn and most likely chop your head off. The director will actually take pity on you if you fail the challenge too many times, you suck, as it will remove the crossbow enemies and the scythe wielding ones. Before we end the video, I want to touch upon some of the amazing combat arenas that the game has, as they just illustrate just how amazing the previous game design mechanics blend together. It's... It's so fucking beautiful, man. The first example of this comes pretty early on, and it's also where most people will probably die. The village lends itself to a wide variety of avenues for Leon to fight against enemies. You can choose to stick to narrow pads in order to funnel enemies, you can attempt to run and gun the open, or hide in the houses like it's home alone, except with zombies. These options are available to the player to intermingle between at all times, without any explicit messaging. Instead, it's up to the player to find the strategy that works best for them by recognizing the previously mentioned game design mechanics. The anxiety of being stuck in a house with multiple entrances for enemies culminates in the cabin sequence. The enemies have this complete flanking advantage against you, with them eventually taking over the ground floor and forcing you upstairs. This might seem like it'll work in your favor as you can funnel enemies on the stairs, but this all goes to shit when they utilize the futuristic technology of ladders to break into the three windows upstairs. This forces you not to only maintain the flow of enemies on the stairs, but to make constant rotations to the windows in order to push the ladders down. Failing to do this leads to being flanked from four completely different directions in a tiny corner. One of the best examples of enemy placement affecting the guide of flow battle comes from the gallery battle. As soon as the player enters, they're immediately confronted by a ton of bald scythe dudes that are capable of instant killing you. The only means of escape from them is a door to the right that allows you to funnel them. When the player reaches the second floor, they're faced with crossbow enemies that run in between pillars. The player can't catch up to them speed-wise, so it's solidified that you're engaging in a sniper battle with them. Any attempt to stepping out into the middle of the arena results in two rocket-wielding cultists to pop up and really fuck up your day. This solidifies real quick that stepping out into the middle of the arena is a bad fucking idea. With the crossbow enemies dead, the player is forced to activate a button that's near the rocket cultists, whom have decided to hide back behind their painting. The anxiety that comes from having to inch toward the button knowing full well that they can pop out is insane. Sure enough, you hit the button and you advance to the now open door, only for the game to pull a rug out from under you by letting the rocket boys pop back out. After entering the room and hitting another button, the player is greeted by Team Rocket one more time when they open the door in a total jump scare moment. Thankfully, this door is indestructible and closes just in time. This is the game's strongest utilization of subverting the player expectations, as the motive of the two enemies was that they only appear in the painting, thus making any area outside the middle of the arena safe. Instead, having them appear directly in front of you is just plain cruel and beautiful in a really messed up way. Now that's fucked up. Thanks for sticking around and watching this stupid long video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed watching it. I sure as hell spent a lot of sleepless nights on it, and I had a hell of a time doing it. You know, in a good way, not bad. Huge shout out to Francisca for doing the voiceover for this video. Make sure to check out his channel Yugi Boom, where they do a lot of stuff that revolves around, well, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh stuff. It's kind of in the name, it's kind of a smart name like that. I've already got a couple more videos in the pipeline, but they hopefully shouldn't take as long as this video. They'll be on the shorter side, around 5 to 10 minutes, not, you know, 30 plus minute endeavors. And they should mostly be focusing on a specific detail or specific kind of design thing instead of an overall encompassing thing about the entire game. I mean, damn dude, this video took freaking forever. Let me just show you what the uh, timeline looks like real quick. It's a uh, a lot of edits, a lot of, you know, tiny little video effects, a lot of transitions to help smooth things out. But if you can, make sure you like this video, hit the subscribe button, and if you're feeling, you know, like, really naughty, you can go in and hit the little bell button so you actually get a notification each time I upload a video or, you know, do whatever. This actually helps out a lot more than you think. I'd actually, not necessarily I'm in this for the channel to blow up, but you know what? It'd be nice to have my, uh, what, what how much time I spend on this? Four... 
four or five sleepless nights on, so it'd be nice to have that work vindicated, you know? Also go ahead and check out my Twitch channel, it's where I go ahead and stream all of my recording processes, so you can go ahead and jump in there, give me shit whenever I'm, you know, fucking up too bad in the game, something like that. Uh, you can also check out my Twitter, I don't actively post too much at the moment, it's mainly just replying to other people, other people in the games industry. With all that out of the way, uh, just thank you for watching.